So this is a talk about risk management and risk as an element in the translation process. And my basic thinking is this, that when people speaking different languages come into contact, there's a number of things that can happen. Okay? They can have a lingua franca, they can speak English as we're doing in this group and, and, and other groups. They can develop a pidgin, a basic form of a lingua franca, uh, such as developed in the as was developed in the Mediterranean uh, in the medieval period with the uh, Sabir, uh, or pidgin English, pidgin French, pidgin German. Those pidgins develop into creoles. Creoles are, are used as means of communication. One party can learn the other's language or both can learn a bit of the other's language so as to get passive uh, competence so you can have bilingual conversations. I speak French and you speak German and we'll understand each other well enough. Although that option is rarely actually carried out in my experience. Anyway. Uh, we have code switching, that is when people switch languages between sentences or within a sentence and that's the means of communication. And finally, you can have translation, which is when one language is being replaced by another via a mediator. But look at all the things that can happen without a mediator. Now, do not think cross-cultural or interlingual communication equals translation. Not so. There's a lot else happening out there, especially in the realm of spoken language, which we tend to forget about far too often. Now, what's the problem with translation? It's incredibly expensive. I will show you why. Let's compare translation with learning the other person's language. When you learn a language over time, okay, you invest a lot of effort, if not money, but at least your effort. At the beginning, you work a lot. But as you go on, it gets easier and easier. So you may never get to absolute competence, which is an ideal anyway, but when you get up to here around T3, well, you're speaking the language well enough to, to do something with it. Okay, and you've invested a lot of effort at the beginning, but it gets easier. Translation, on the other hand, is the same at the beginning and after one year, two years, three years, you're still paying that translator to do the page or to spend the hour of their time. Okay, I include interpreters here in translation. Language learning costs decrease over time. Translation costs do not. Basic lesson. If you've got a communication situation that's short term, a business meeting in Thailand and you don't speak Thai and they don't speak your language get a translator get an interpreter okay it's just a one-off meeting but let's say your company is in Germany and you want to set up your business in Thailand because these meetings have been successful you're looking at T3 and beyond what are you going to do employ translators all the time and interpreters no you're going to learn some Thai or train the staff to learn German if you if you work, you know, within the company structure. If you're interested in this, uh, between T2 and T3, it makes sense to adopt both strategies. Have some translation and some language learning. When I worked for the Barcelona Olympic Games, I started as a language teacher. I was teaching the executives English, and then the same people. Uh, were giving me translation work to do. So both strategies were used. I think T3 is about four years. That's the Olympiad, okay, for a big project. Now, the basic message for us today is translation is relatively expensive. It's a luxurious product, ladies and gentlemen, to be used carefully for short-term contacts. 
Is the European Union a short-term project or a long-term project, ladies and gentlemen? Should it be using translation as its communication strategy? Ah. Okay. Now, I'm trying in this, I'm thinking about these problems. Okay, this, is, this is a way I'm thinking. I haven't got big answers, but I'm grappling. I, I need theorization that can help me think about these things. I want to explain what happens in projects and communication acts but I also want to explain what should happen. That's unfashionable. Remember, descriptive translation studies went against prescriptive approaches. I think it's time we went back and were able to say, as intellectuals or academics, well, it would be better if we could try this alternative. Or, you know, don't forget language learning along with the translation. You recognize translation when it fails, when there are mistakes. Let's say there are always mistakes, but you're allowed to have one or two. You're translating a birth certificate. Where are you going to make the mistake? In the name of the person born? No. The date of birth? Don't think so the name of the midwife. The midwife is the nurse who brings the child into the world. Well, if you're going to make a mistake, do it there and not in the others. Okay? Uh, this is a, a, an example I, I borrow from Roberto Mayoral, who works in Granada, who wrote a book called Translating Official Documents, and uh, he uh, translates for the Pakistani community around Granada, and it's an example he, he explains in the book, where, ah, uh, I've forgotten my Urdu, but the name of the midwife is something like Masawa, okay? This one midwife, Masawa, has brought 5,000 Pakistanis into the world because her name appears on every birth certificate translated into Spanish in the Granada region. And it turns out that Masawa is the Uda word for midwife. Okay, so this, it's a mistake. It's a mistake that's made all the time and nobody cares. Why? Because the issuing authorities don't care about the name of the midwife. They just write midwife. And the receiving authorities in Spain accept this fiction because they don't need that information either for their official documents. So it's a mistake. But who cares? You can make mistakes, ladies and gentlemen, and nobody cares about them. As long as they're in places that are not high risk. You get the idea of risk? There are low risk places in a text and high risk places in a text. So I try to teach my students when they come in, work hard on the things that are high risk and don't work too hard on the things that are low risk. Go fast with those things that aren't essential and do all the documentation on those things that are essential. Distribute your effort according to the risk. Distribute the resources of your community according to where there is high risk. Unfortunately, my students only remember the lesson don't work too hard but what can we do? Note that when I'm talking in these terms, I say work hard there, don't work too hard there, go quickly there, I'm not referring to anything like equivalence. You know, I think it basically assumes that if you work a lot on a problem, you'll get closer to a better solution. Not always true. You can work too hard and it gets worse, but still. Uh, but I'm not talking about equivalence or anything like that. I'm talking about risk. Risk of what, though? Risk for me is basically the probability of not meeting success conditions. There's a huge literature on risk. Uh, go to Wikipedia. Risk management, risk analysis, whatever. Uh, probability of not meeting success. Probability of failing. 
that's what risk is. Trouble is, you have to know what success means. And we know that, that uh, Skopos theory has been talking about that as if it were obvious, and I don't think it is obvious. But I happen to have a theory of ethics that suggests that success means mutual benefits. If we have a successful communication act, it's good for me and it's good for you. Or better, it's better for me to talk with you than it is for me not to talk with you or to talk with someone else. Okay, so we have a conversation and we both get something out of it. Then it's a success. I'm not talking about understanding the same thing or transferring the idea or anything like that. I just say it's better for us to have this than not to have it or to have it with someone else. Okay? Mutual benefits applies to everything, all communication acts, not just sex. Although and it's a basis for an ethics, but take my word for it, that's another talk. I'm not going into the ethics now, I just want you to assume something like that. For this mode of thought to work, what we get out of the Communication Act, what I get out of it, what you get out of it, must be of more value than the effort we put into it. Got it? So, so a quick, easy, low-cost communication act can be mutually beneficial and great. And a, and a bit of communication that we work too hard on. You know, what do you mean, hello? Let me get my dictionary out. Hello? Oh, yes. Uh, is not going to be ethically beneficial. It's going to be too much work. So it's actually quite good to have cheap communication. Everybody knows this except academics. Uh, you were getting somewhere. Huh? Cheap communication can be good. Expensive communication is good when there's lots of benefits to ensue, when there's lots of cooperation for, for, for all parties. It was. Example two. This is for students coming to Tarragona to study in our wonderful Masters and PhD program. Uh, our official website says somewhere in Spanish and Catalan, foreign students will need to convalidar or homologar their first degree. We had to translate this in our, uh, our, uh, our translation class. We had it as a project. Okay. Um, you may debate to great length how to render these two verbs. But if you choose the strategy of uh, parallel text, that is, you go into here an American university website, you look for the bit that talks about foreign students coming in, you won't find convalidate and you won't find homologate, thank goodness. Uh, what you find is accreditation, a reference to accreditation. Uh, foreign students must seek accreditation. This is what the Americans talk about. So we might say con convalidación, equivalent accreditation, like rabbit gavagai, remember? And you find homologación equals gavagai, no, accreditation. Oh dear, two words in Spanish and one word in English. What are we going to do? And my translation class can debate that for ages and ages. Let me try a risk analysis with this problem. I could put seek accreditation. Foreign students must seek accreditation. I'm not wrong. I'm not terribly right. But it's low risk. You know, foreign students will know that, hey, you have to do something about your documents. It's actually uh, a pretty risky option because um, the accreditation is of the issuing institution. Okay, What's accredited would be the foreign university, not your degree. Whereas uh, um, obligación refers to your degree. Okay, So it, it really is a different system. But no. 
What about if I use the Spanish terms? Low risk. I can't be wrong. Low effort. Don't have to think too much. What about if I leave it out? That's even less effort. High risk or low risk? Mm -hmm. Pretty high risk. Because if all the students come along with their original degrees and we say, sorry, you have to go back home and get all those stamps, all those legalizations, all those apostilles. Not good. Okay. So you can go through the options and say high risk, low risk. You know, not beneficial for the student, not to get any information about this. Uh, not really beneficial to get misleading information, but some information is better than none at this, at this level. However, to solve this problem, you need more information. Okay? Now, my point here is that linguistics is not enough. With, with all due respect to the linguists among us, Linguistic analysis of a text will not tell you where the risk lies. You know, the text is written in Spanish for a reader who knows automatically what convalidación is and what homologación is. And, and text analysis is not going to tell you, oh, danger approaching, watch out, you know, foreign students being misled, or foreign students being seduced improperly. Uh, Success conditions are not in the text. The birth certificate has three noun phrases. They're noun phrases. Linguistic analysis cannot tell you that one is low risk and the other two are high risk, I think. Unless, of course, we incorporate risk analysis into linguistic analysis and we're doing fancy pragmatics, in which case I'd be very happy. The risk I'm talking about has very little to do with the fact that different cultures handle problems in different ways. Okay, uh, Michael Agar is an American anthropologist, linguist, talks about rich points in communication across cultures. The points where uh, the, the conceptual divisions of the world are fundamentally different and we have to discuss a lot. One of his prime examples are the T and V forms, the formal and informal second person. Okay, the in Spanish, tu uh, usted, French, tu vous, German, du sie. Uh, in these languages, they do not correspond. The division between when you can use the tu and when you can use tu is radically different. I remember being bothered about this as when I was a student in France. So for one year, I did not use the second person. Interesting stuff outside the window. You know, third person. Yeah. <laughs> now, many rich points, many points where our conceptual, you know, grids do not overlap or, or, or join up in any, any, any way, are handled quite well by um, strategies of uh, what I just illustrated, strategies of evasion, uh, avoidance strategies, uh, or omission. Um, that's done quite often. You know, you, you realize if you're talking with somebody from a different culture, you realize there are areas of food and areas of sexuality and taboo areas that you just don't bring up in polite conversation. This is done all the time. They're rich points, but we don't really need those rich points for a lot of what we're going to do. Uh, similarly, you know, if I'm worried in Spanish about the tu usted, I use a reflexive form. Problem solved. Uh, so, uh, high risk, rich, rich points are not necessarily high risk. They can be high risk or low risk. If they are high risk, then you spend a lot of time working on that. You do it with great care, but often they're not. 